have heard the subject, friends, but it has nothing whatever to do with the telegram about love that was sent by a young man to his girl. And it read, love, 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 love. <laughs> and the Western Union operator said, you have only nine words, you're allowed 10 for that price. And he said, well, what can I say? What else? Well, she said, you can put in another love. He said, well, that'd make it sound kind of silly. <laughs> Our subject, the intimacies of love, does imply some increase of communication of friend with friend. There is a growth in affection, just as, for example, there is a difference between radio, which is sound, television, which is vision, and personal appearance. That also explains to why some are disappointed when they see someone they have seen on television not so long ago, I was in a church procession in Brooklyn. I was going into the church, and there was a woman alongside. As I passed by, she said, Glory be to God, you certainly look much better on television. <laughs> well, the three intimacies of love we will use later on in reference to the life of our blessed Lord, but the first of the intimacies of love, even in the human order, is speech or hearing. We would never know that anyone loved us unless he told us so. Speech is the summation of a soul. All that it has been, all that it is, and all that it will ever be. We need only hear a person talk and we say, He's a smart man. He's a cruel man. He's a kind man. He has a gentle soul. Somehow or other, character comes out through the barriers of the flesh in words. It is not the most intimate kind of communication that we can have with anyone. Aristotle, the wise Greek philosopher, once said that it was the least of the senses. And he went on to explain why we generally are much more kind to the blind than to the deaf. He said, because vision is a more spiritual sense. And we're apt to become more impatient with those who are wanting in hearing. That, at any rate, was his view. But in any case, love begins with a word and with speech. That is one of the reasons why, when you hear people read long, long discourses, read off teleprompters and so forth, or read speeches that have been done by ghost writers, you wonder, am I really hearing the heart that talks this or not? So if there therefore is to be any love communicated between God and man, God has to speak. We have to hear. Otherwise, we would never know that he loved us. When did he speak? Turn over the pages of the Old Testament. This is the speech of God. There you read, for example, such words as, I will be to you a shepherd, and you will be my sheep. And those that are with young, I will carry. If your sins are as scarlet, they shall be made white as snow. And if they are as red as crimson, they shall be made white as wool. And then not only in the Old Testament, but I think every pagan people on the face of the earth heard in some way the speech of God. Buddha, Confucius, Laotse. All of them, in some way, communicated some feebler intimacy with the divine. Like the Greek dramatist Sophocles, who yearned for a redeemer. Look not for any end, he said, moreover, to this curse, until some god appears. To accept upon his head 
the pangs of thy own sins vicarious. In Virgil, about 30 years before Christ was born, in his fourth eclogue said, Smile, chaste woman, on thy infant boy, with whom the Iron Age will pass away and the Golden Age on all the earth be born. And finally, there did come a time when men heard God in a strange way. One night there rang out over the stillness of an evening breeze, out over the white chalked hills of Bethlehem, a cry, a gentle cry. The sea did not hear the cry, for the sea was filled with its own voice. The great ones of the earth did not hear the cry, for they could not understand how a child could be greater than a man. Two classes of people heard the cry, shepherds and wise men. Shepherds, those who know they know nothing, and wise men, those who know they do not know everything. Never the man with one book. And they came in response to the cry of a babe. And that babe grew in age and grace and wisdom, and men heard God speaking. They heard him speaking in anger, for example, in righteous indignation, particularly against hypocrisy. And he called the hypocrites a brood of vipers. Men pointing to the tombstones on the other side of the hill. They were whitewashed three times a year. Lightening them to the hypocrites, he said, you're like these tombs. Outside clean, inside full of dead men's bones. And then they heard his voice too. And he saw a lily, a wild lily of the field. And he was the word made voice, now spoke and pleaded for trust in divinity as he said, Behold the lilies of the field. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed as one of these. And if God then so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more you, O ye of little faith. But I suppose that there was no time when men heard the voice of God, when there was a more staggering utterance than the day when someone said to him, Thou art not yet fifty years old. Hast thou seen Abraham? And he answered with the casualness with which a man might look over his shoulder. Before Abraham began to be, I am. It was Sinai, it was the voice of God on earth. But is that enough? Is any human lover satisfied simply when he hears the voice of the beloved? Some voices please, others do not. And even when they please, they still are unsatisfied. I remember once I was instructing someone in Washington, D.C. And we met in the dining room, and this gentleman said to me, pointing to the parrot, he said, I have a parrot there. He said that that makes queer noises when a certain politician talks. He just doesn't like the sound of his voice. And he said, as you instruct me, I don't know whether he's going to like yours or not. But he says, be prepared for a reaction. So I began, I forgot all about the parrot, and I was talking about the existence of God, and I ended up rather dramatically after 10 or 15 minutes, and I said, therefore, God exists. And the parrot said, oh, boy. (laughs) 
So there has to be some other intimacy of love besides hearing, and that is vision. We want to see the flash of an eye, the earnestness of a visage. We want to see the words of love born on human lips. Human love demands this, and rightly so. It craves presence. And that was why, if God was ever to satisfy all the aspirations of man, he had to come to this earth. And he had to make himself visible. And the only way that he could ever make himself visible was by taking a human body. And in that human body, divinity would dwell. Then we would see God well in human form, yes. And this human body of his would be an instrument of his divinity, not a separable instrument. For example, like this pen. Isn't that a fancy one we have on this show? This is a separable instrument. That is to say, he is not necessarily united with my person. But when he took upon himself a human nature, that human nature was united with him much more intimately, for example, than my arm as an instrument is united to my personality. And his mother gave him this human nature with which he would speak, with which he would suffer, would give him hands to be nailed feet to be fettered, and a body that would move among men. I believe that one of the reasons for idolatry in pre-Christian days was the desire of human minds and hearts to see God in the dust of human existence. I remember once going up to the hill of the Areopagus in Athens thinking of all of the gods that Paul saw as he walked through the streets and the marketplace. And then the idea came to me, maybe these people were saying, oh, these gods that dwell on Olympian heights, they're too far away from us, too far away from our woes, our sorrows, and our pains. And if the gods will not come down and dwell with us, then we'll force them to do it. We'll turn them into mud and into clay and into silver and into gold. That was a legitimate aspiration of the human heart. And so if, if God was ever to love, he had to be seen. And he was seen. And he became Emmanuel, or God with us. And he was seen in many attitudes. He was seen, for example, in his beauty. I think there are several ways we understand something about the beauty of that divine presence both negative ways, one from women and the other from men. One day our Lord was preaching, and a woman interrupted him, not paying any attention to his discourse. And she let loose from herself words that betrayed the desire of every woman in the presence of some young man whom she would have loved to have mothered. And she said, Blessed is the womb that bore thee and the breast that nursed thee. In other words, the tremendous majesty and bearing and dignity of Christ was such that this woman could not rest only in his words. All her motherly maternal instinct came out. She cried out to be the mother of Emmanuel. Not only that, I think there was another sign, negative sign given by men. Cruel men. When wicked men are in the face of another man, was their superior intellectually and physically and morally and spiritually. They tried to degrade him. And that accounts, I think, 
for the tremendous cruelty that was shown to the person of our Lord on Holy Thursday night when he was arrested. The plating of crown of thorns upon his head, the buffeting him with blows, the blindfolding him, the mocking him. Men were bound to degrade him. If they could not have the majesty of his bearing, then they would bring him down to their own mean, low existence. These are just negative ways of knowing how beautiful was this son of man as he walked the earth. But I think there was still another way, and that was when he was seen in the transfiguration. Here he was on the mount with Peter, James, and John. His face did shine as the sun. His garments white as snow. Divinity was shining through his body, which I believe was perhaps the more normal way for that body to be. You put a, a great light behind an alabaster marble. The light will shine through the marble. Do you think you can put divinity into a human nature and not have it shine through? With this tremendous effulgence made the human nature transparent. If you pour something red into a glass, it looks red. The glass looks red. Pour divinity into this humanity, or assume this humanity into divinity, and so it glows. And that was the beauty that men saw. But it was not enough, though he did say, he that seeth me seeth the Father. There's one other intimacy. An intimacy that is so delicate, so refined, so intimate and personal, that it is given to but a few. The greatest insult that anyone can give us, who knows us not, is to make use of it. And that is the intimacy of touch. Touch is sympathy. Touch is personal communion. Touch is the utmost in kindness. Touch is healing. And if therefore God came to this earth and spoke and was seen, and if he was to exhaust all of the deep personal communications, he must touch. He must be touched. He touched. He touched the lepers. He touched the blind, the deaf. He touched the young daughter of Jairus and rose her from the dead. His sensitive fingers took hold of the hand of Peter's mother-in-law and cured her. But it was not enough to touch. He must be touched. Mankind must come as close as it can to divinity. And he was touched. He was touched, first of all, by the pagan woman that came through a crowd and touched the hem of his garment. And she said, if I but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be healed. And our Lord, willing to try and wishing to try her faith, turned to the apostles and said, who touched me? 
And they said, everyone's crowding you round about. Why do you ask who touched me? And our Lord said, because I felt a power go out from me. Kind of a sacramental order, the material being the channel for the communication of the divine. But that was not the only time he was touched. He was touched when a woman uninvited came into the house of Simon and broke a bottle of precious perfume over his feet and let fall upon his feet like the first warm drops of a summer rain a few tears and wiped them away with her hair. Creature had touched the feet of God. But then there was another touch. Ten witnesses came once to Thomas, and they said, Thomas, we've seen the Lord. And Thomas said, until I can see the mark of nails in his hands, until I can put my finger into the mark of those nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And with that, after the resurrection, our Lord appeared, and he said, Thomas, give me thy finger. Here is my hand. Put thy hand into my side. Doubt not, but believe. Thomas was right. He knew that the only God that could save us was one who had scars and took our pains upon himself. Now there's nothing more that can be done. He has been heard, he has been seen, he has been touched. He's heard in words. But I speak to you as you open your scriptures. He's seen, he's seen in the church, he's seen by faith. He's seen in the poor and the hungry and the lame and the blind, all those whom you help. For he is in them. Touch. That is rare. That's for the intimates. That is a very special kind of communion. There are many touched him this morning. I did. I wish you could. <laughs>